Uh, my name is David McConville. I have a company uh, called the Illuminati that I co-founded about seven years ago. That's a design and engineering firm that is focused on developing immersive projection environments for, that are both portable and uh, fixed within museums and things. And uh, we get hired to help explain complex things to people using uh, immersive visualizations, basically. Well, I'm actually here wearing two hats None at the moment, but well, not right uh, now. Yeah, yeah. But I was invited to come speak uh, as a board member of the Buckminster Fuller Institute for a project that uh, we have going on called the Buckminster Fuller Challenge. Um, but I'm also here to give an ecological tour of the cosmos tomorrow night at the after party at California Academy of Sciences, which is basically flying people through a, probably the world's biggest video game of scientific data um, to help them understand the ways in which uh, the universe is conspiring to keep us alive right now. <laughs> um, when we zoom out and, and look at the model of the Earth and really help people to understand that this image that we have of Earth, you know, I say Earth and you imagine it in your mind, and it's probably something like the Earthrise photograph or the blue marble image that's so iconic, but that is really just this very tiny limited sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It's the part that we can see. But there's actually all this other stuff going on around the planet that we just can't see because of the limitations of our vision. And turning on different layers to help people see all the different flows and interactions uh, can have a profound effect if people understand the, the connections. But, but even beyond that, just something as simple as turning on the constellations and then moving far enough away so that you get beyond this particular view of the stars where we are uh, in the universe and can see the constellations from a different perspective where of course they look completely different and I think it really helps to drive home the point our species on this planet has a very specific perspective on things and that if we were somewhere else we would have a different perspective and the reason I think that's profound is because it's actually a pretty good metaphor for each of us as individuals. I mean, we all think there's some objective reality out there, you know, a lot of the time. But we actually all come to these issues with very unique perspectives, very unique experiences. And so using the scientific data as a way to help people better understand that, that it's the very nature of ecosystems that every organism has a unique perspective on it. And it's critically important for us as humans to communicate those perspectives and appreciate the fact that other people might not experience the world in the same way that we do because we're all living in these dramatically different worlds and I don't think we're aware of it most of the time. I think the way that we've been trained in, in so many ways uh, to, within Western culture is to think that everything's kind of can eventually be controlled or predicted or reduced to its fundamental components because we tend to see nature as this vast machine sometimes um, that really comes out of the scientific revolution and you know these are thought patterns that have been established for a long time but by helping people understand the the processes and metabolic flows and environmental interactions and ecological interactions around the planet uh, my hope is that we can really start to help people gain a greater appreciation of how complex and nonlinear these systems are and how important it is for us to take responsibility for the fact that these infrastructures that we make, that we call human society, have tremendous impacts on the ability for uh, global ecosystems to function. Well, climate change is particularly interesting. It's very hard, actually. It's one of the hardest topics to visualize. And, and sometimes, I mean, bar graphs are actually perfectly fine um, in, in helping people to understand uh, different types of nonlinear curves and acceleration of things. Um, and so the work that we're doing right now, I'm not necessarily just trying to say, uh, well, here's the carbon and there's the carbon and there's the carbon and thinking that that's going to necessarily be that much more effective than a bar graph. I think to really understand climate change, we have to understand the systems of the planet. Because climate change is, is, is just one aspect. It's a symptom of a much greater issue. 
of how human societies are structured. And if you want to understand climate change, you also have to really understand uh, deforestation and species extinction and pollution. And I mean, they're all really interrelated, and climate change, rightfully so, is getting the most attention right now because it is the biggest challenge facing us and something we can do the most about in the shortest amount of time, I think. Um, but my interest is in how we can maybe take the narrow focus just off of that for even just a little, little bit to help people see the ways in which that's actually connected to all of these other systems. Because I think the problem is when you reduce the symptom to this one thing, it becomes a topic that people can kind of say, oh, I believe in that or I don't believe in that, right? It's this kind of binary thing that it's so much more complex than that. And to help people gain a greater appreciation of the systems of the planet and how they interoperate and their interdependencies, and to really create an emotional connection to that for people so that we can be much more appreciative of all of the things that are happening to help us live here. Um, climate change is, can be seen through a new lens that you know, it really is one symptom of a lot of things that we're doing that we need to be transforming so that it's in, it's in uh, accordance with natural principles. So I'm on the board of the Buckminster Fuller Institute where I primarily focus on how we can incubate projects that are being submitted to the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, which is a yearly award that we give away. It's $100,000 to uh, projects that are geared towards helping 100% of humanity in the shortest amount of time without ecological offense to anyone. Well, last year's winner uh, was a, a biologist named John Todd who had a proposal, has a proposal, for how to begin to clean up West Virginia that's been completely devastated by years of mountaintop removal. And he, for decades, has been working on techniques of bioremediation, utilizing plants to extract toxins uh, from water. But his plan is so much more than that. It's to, how do you clean up these giant lakes of toxic sludge from the leftovers from the coal extraction process, but then what do you do with that? How do you rebuild community? How do you utilize the mountains there for generating renew renewable energies? How do you build out farms so that you know, people can own their land and, and create you know, the, all the infrastructures they need for having a healthy community? This year's winner um, winners was a team from MIT's Media Lab that have completely reconceived uh, transportation from a systems perspective where they've developed uh, a scooter, an automobile, and a bicycle wheel, all of which are electric, uh, that are really... I, I was so impressed when I got to talk to the team because they weren't just looking to design a new car. They weren't just looking to create a cool scooter. They were looking at how do, all of, how, how do these fit into existing cities so we don't have to build a new infrastructure but how can we maximally utilize uh, networking technologies, for instance, so that we can avoid congestion? How can we look at economic models so that people that can't afford to buy one of these can still have access to the transportation? You know, so they were looking at the bike models that are popular in Europe where you rent a bike for a while or a zip car kind of model. Um, and these electric vehicles are able to pull up to curbs and be charged uh, wirelessly uh, and they're very simple, actually, relative to kind of the complex mechanics of contemporary vehicles. And, you know, they're really looking at how can transportation infrastructure serve an entire community and be rapidly deployed. And so what we would like to do is to utilize these incredible folks that we have on the jury to really help select which projects out there are, ta are taking these comprehensive approaches. And I think by, by leveraging the kind of hive mind, the collective intelligence of a lot of the folks that are, that are out there, um, it can provide an opportunity for maybe accelerating the pace of change and funding and realization of a number of these projects. And that's so necessary right now. <laughs>